Hey, folks, it's Lindsey Huddleston back at it again, the SBS Ed Show with my great co-host, Mr. Terry McCoy Jr. And of course, we got Mr. Orlando Watkins, Coach Orlando Watkins, uh, keeping us out here in the world. We always call him Houston because uh, he keeps us connected no matter where he is on the planet. He's uh, keeping us grounded. But Terry, we're back with another show, man. And I'm excited, man. I'm excited about the topics that we have. I'm excited that we get this platform to sit and share on. And man, I'm excited about you and your growth and the things you have going. And I'm also excited about a new sponsors come on. That's Easy Work. Shout out to my guy, Bruce Tony with Easy Work Apparel. You've seen me with that when I was down at the Motor City Smoothie Company in Detroit. Uh, shout out to Chuck Bailey. But Easy Work is coming on board to support the movement. And we want to support them too. Uh, some great clothing, uh, some great things coming from Bruce, Toby, and uh, Easy Work. So I want to thank them for their support of the SBS Edge Show podcast. And also got to give a shout out to my guys, the streets are watching. That is Don Houston and Clarence Sumo. Uh, uh, that is my guy, no doubt, holding it down, uh, always keeping things together. And I, I appreciate that. So with that, Terry, let's talk about what we're going to be discussing. Uh, put it out there. You can kind of kick us off, man. We get going with these things. So, you know, breaking news coming into this game. First, MSU Maryland. Uh, coming in this week, their time was TB, TBD. Uh, yeah. to be determined, and they weren't sure if they were going to play because the week before Maryland's game was canceled because of COVID results and uh, positive COVID tests within their team, and uh, th their game got canceled against Ohio State. And so now we come into this week, their game's canceled against Michigan State, you know, a game that MSU was looking to bounce back after a tough loss to Indiana. But, I mean, it got to the point where their head coach, Mike Loxley, was even uh, – he announced that he tested positive. So Maryland is in kind of the situation that Wisconsin was in where they're just trying to get their players healthy. They're not really too worried about competing, but I mean, players health first, and I'm glad they're taking the right precautions to try to get this thing rolling for them. Yeah, you're right, man. When you hear from the perspective of Coach Mel Tucker, who's very good friends with Coach Mike Loxley at Maryland, and then they're talking and going back and forth. But I knew, I had a feeling we were going to get the most professional response because we were in a press conference with them on Tuesday. And I just had a feeling, he said, hey, we're doing everything we can to prepare to play. But I had a feeling it was kind of like, no. And especially when they said, hey, two days of not practicing, that's not good for college football. You can't not practice. Unlike basketball, you know, maybe the time off, the rest is one thing, but you cannot practice uh, with football on any level and then expect to go and compete at a very high level. So that's what it is. And the, and the NCAA has said, you know, they're not going to make up the game. It's just kind of a wash. And I just think that it's, it's a little bit more what this COVID life is. And I'll say this, Terry, I'll say this. You know, I've always been very passionate about uh, people masking up and keeping their social distance and us doing the right thing. But I, I really want to say, I feel good about how with the right kind of effort, we're getting through this. You know, uh, we're not really going to talk about it too much today, but we have the, uh, you know, the high school, MHSA looking at returning back to practice and sports December 9th. So we're finding a way through it, but you're getting these, I won't even call them hiccups, but byproducts of the pandemic era, which you may have a game that was scheduled to go. And I, and I'm the only thing I feel good about at first that the players aren't playing so that their safety is put, put being put as paramount. But, you know, I, I hate that, um, you know, it would have been a game that was an away game. So I wouldn't have been at Spartan stadium to cover it. But, you know, it looks like they'll be probably back against Northwestern the following week and we'll be able to see something. But, I mean, but this is what we're dealing with, Terry. I mean, we, we started off this podcast, you know, early on talking about COVID and how it affects our lives. We started this early on. I mean, when I talk about the Streets of Talking, which is where this is airing also at www.streetsoftalking.com with Clarence Rabar and uh, Mr. Carman Don Houston uh, representing, you know, this was born out of the COVID you know, pandemic impact in our lives. And now we're seeing it. Remember, we didn't even think we would see college football. College football got sure. back on. Now we're seeing new head coach and Mel Tucker getting his thing going, the back and forth. And then all of a sudden, uh, another Big Ten team is shut down by the COVID. But they're going to do what they got to do. People are going to just make sure that everyone's straight and move on. And, and I'm a little inspired by it because I guess what? Because I'm still a sports fan at heart, man. And I want, I'm feeling that we're doing the right thing. And we're keeping healthy as best as possible kudos to Michigan State, and hopefully this can stay the case. No COVID test, having to shut them down. So you see mo most programs are getting it right, and that, that gives me inspiration to know that we can probably, going forward, live a life 
uh, with sports during this pandemic time because I, I'm really hoping that even when they talk about the second wave coming and we being amongst it, and, and it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, Terry, when we hear about the loss of life and what's happening. But overall, I think we're moving through it. And I think I'm saying that with a thought of compassion. It's not saying look through it, but uh, unfortunately, it won't be an MSU versus Maryland game, but I'm glad that the, to the, the topic is about health. And uh, if there's anything else you want to say on it, let's hear that. But if not, that probably will take us to our next topic, which is the NCAA tournament being in the bubble in this COVID time. You want to share anything about that? I think you uh, you, you kind of covered it. I feel like, you know, the whole thing of not being able to practice during the week and taking weeks off, I know how important scheme and game planning is for for uh, the sport of football. Somebody and I get see hurt that. real bad. Somebody can get physically right. hurt along with COVID, but really hurt real bad if they're not schemed up right and, and had that practice time. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, same thing with the NFL. We're seeing teams where – they shut down like my Browns. They had to shut their shut down their facility a couple of times this week because of wow. COVID cases. And I mean, if they're doing that in the NFL and like they're, I mean, the NFL, you kind of know what you're gonna do. But college, I mean, with MSU and with Maryland and these teams that are like getting better as the week goes, they need to have those preparation weeks to try and get that win. And so I yeah. think just seeing, you know, Maryland have to miss those days. I don't think they would have had their best output on on Saturday. So, I mean, it kind of goes – it gives MSU that buy of, like, if they beat them, oh, they didn't practice, they didn't do this. So, I mean, it yeah. keeps MSU hungry for uh, Northwestern. That's a good point. Home. That's a good point when you talk about uh, how, how people will rate the win, uh, even if, you know, and, and the NCAA didn't, or Big Ten didn't allow for it to be a forfeit, but you're absolutely right. But that's that plan in this time of COVID. And then it transitions right over, man. You know, we talk about – the, uh, the NCAA tournament, you know, and, and people pushing for and looking at a bubble tight atmosphere, you know, uh, I think that's the next step in saying we're, we're, we're working our way through it. But, you know, a tournament in one location, I wonder what it'll be like, you know, I mean, I, you get an idea. Like you said, the, the, the NBA, you know, kind of perfected at this point. But, you know, I, I guess it's great to have had that blueprint there the whole time and people can look at the NCAA uh, tournament and say, OK, that can be a viable option. We all know how impactful March Madness is. What do you think? I think I just hope, you know, and pray that college basketball, the NCAA, uses the amount of resources that the NBA used. I mean, we're seeing different uh, venues for the NBA. They're coming in using two different courts to have these games. I mean, because we know, I mean, the round of 68 and then the round of 64, then 32, a lot of basketball is being played in one city. So, I mean, you hope that to keep, you know, to put on restrictions with social distancing, and uh, maybe allowing family later on, like the NBA did, sure. and maybe in, and hopefully having like different areas where guys can be in hotels and you know similar protocol that the NBA had about you know uh, daily symptom checker, uh, you know seeing about your fever if you have a fever or not, and you know you just hope that they use all the resources because the NBA was like a guinea pig. I mean they're gonna try it out, they're trying to uh, finish their season, and right. so guys like basketball where you can be in like the same area and it's not as much prep time as football, as you said earlier, right. I feel like it's something that can be done, but it's a lot of commitment that needs a big commitment that needs to be made by everyone. Well, I mean, the, the, the side of relief I get when we talk about uh, potential of NCAA following the NBA's lead is they got money, man. And then the university's got money too. So you got these two different entities just like that. But with the NBA for the most part, they're like the organization that brings it together, but those teams, have right. money. So the money is out there and I think they're going to look at it in the same way. They want to protect their investment. They want to make sure there's some, uh, you know, health integrity and in college basketball and what's going on. And then that's all to let's talk about the bottom line, man. It's about a lot of money, man. It's a lot of money to be made. It's a lot of money that got caught up and got lost when there wasn't a season. And, you know, you just think oh, back, yeah. we're talking about Cassius and, you know, Xavier in the draft. But I just remember when the season ended, you know what I'm saying? It was over during mm -hmm. the tournament. I remember being there March 13th and uh, you know, Indianapolis, you know, right. And Indianapolis is well suited for it. If any place is suited for a, a bubble type atmosphere is Indianapolis, because it is very uh, 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 friendly in the sense of being able to connect and put pieces together. I mean, from okay. the administration, how the city does work at city hall to how the city is structured to be able to have that kind of movement, man. So being down there on March 13th, when the big 10, you know, canceled this game. Of course, we ended, you know, the college basketball season. It seemed like a lifetime, but it's like this new world that we've been living in, Terry. And here we are, here we are right now. Uh, the NBA draft has come and gone. We've seen it happen. We saw it happen virtually and whatnot. And then also we talk about 
being at this point right now where uh, we're looking at the NBA bubble, excuse me, NBA bubble style basketball being played. I think they're going to be able to pull it off. I think they're going to work lock and step. I mean, think about it. These guys were working together last night, the NBA and colleges, right? The NBA and these organizations, right? Knowing that, uh, you know, these young men are being able to transition. It's the same type of relationship. You know, it's not like these people are new uh, and they're going to just pass that handbook over. I think it's good because we will be able to get to see some basketball. I think we're going to be very appreciative of it, even if we're not able to get on the road and be at the Final Four like most people would. I mean, I was ready to roll, man. The Final Four was scheduled to be <laughs> down in Indianapolis, baby. I was ready to make that trip. You yeah. Know? But, what we have to do, Terry, we have to continue to be mindful. I mean, uh, lives are being lost. Uh, the COVID is real. You know, it seems, thankfully, we got through uh, probably the most critical time from a political standpoint when all the things were heightened and raised, but we still have Donald Trump, you know, uh, laying in the way or looming or whatever or not. But we had all this other social justice, emotional angst going on in the country. And I know you felt it. I know I felt it, man. It doesn't feel like it's like that right now. And it's a good feeling. So I say all that to say, to be able to see college basketball, even if it's in a bubble, Terry, I think is a great thing. And I'm hoping, like I look at it, I hope a lot of people look at it, that we'd be very appreciative of the fact that we'll have it, no matter if it's not the way we normally want it, because we know uh, with the word, everything can shut down. Exactly. And I think that's one thing that athletes have to overcome is being, uh, being in that mindset where things can keep rolling and, you know, you want to keep playing, but any given day, things could be all shut down. Like, I mean, Wilmer could, like, in Michigan standpoint right now, could be like, you know, full lockdown. Everything's closed again, you know, and things open are essential things. So, I mean, just having that mindset of coming in and playing the season, because, I mean, Michigan State's basketball schedule was just released, and they're all excited for tip-off and getting the season kicked off. But, I mean, you still got to work through it. You got to remain optimistic, you know, because you're an athlete. I mean, even in games, you know, things happen and uh, you may it may not go your way, but you always have to be optimistic. I mean, I wouldn't say like really treat it like a game, but uh, in, in that mindset, though, when things don't go your way, you always got to keep pushing and look for opportunities to make the most of what you got. No, you're right. You're right about that. And, and, and imagine that here we are talking. And past news is Coach Tom Mizzo had COVID. He's still in quarantine yep. right now. So, you know, maybe it would have been – you think it would have been more of a headline had it happened during the tournament? It would have probably been more critical because if he's out there and they hit him with the Nick mm -hmm. Saban, like, no, nah, you can't practice or be here, you know, but Nick Saban was able to get around that somehow. But, you know, uh, you look at – I just think that it put everyone on notice, man. But, but I'm still, you know, encouraged by the fact that we can possibly see something like this happen, man. So we talk about the NCAA bubble, man. We probably could spend a buck of the time, you know, talking about the NBA, you know, and what's that's been like, you know, because there's a lot that's happened with the draft. There's a lot of different aspects. We have the local part, too, when you talk about guys like Xavier Tillman and Cassius Wilson. So we'll definitely better get into it. I just want to take a moment again and shout out our new sponsor, uh, Easy Work. Shout out to... Uh, my guy, you know, uh, brother uh, Bruce Tony, uh, you know, Toby and holding it down, uh, doing good things. So with that, I want to keep putting it out there, man. Uh, uh, some great things are happening with the Streets of Talking podcast. Uh, it's great to be able to be there. We're on at 12 uh, on Saturday and Sunday uh, at www.thestreetsofthetalking.com. Uh, Terry, uh, it'd be great if you could just pop on and hear your voice to see how far you've come from just being a bright young man at Eastern <laughs> High School handling business transitioning on to his college uh, days and being able to hear, have his voice be heard and, and have an impact with the words he used, inspiring others, including myself. So, man, uh, you've been putting your homework in, talking about this NBA draft, 2020 NBA draft, man. Let's let's kick off the Terry McCord Jr. NBA draft profile, man. Do the, 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 you take us take to the draft, man, and see what's going on. And when we get a chance to get to, you know, some guys we know, we can talk a little bit more uh, about that. But, you know, Okay, how, how about this? If we do a little audible before we do the NBA draft, because it's a lot with that. How about we lead, we lead up to it, talking about the big trade with Chris Paul and oh, yeah. uh, the Phoenix Suns? How about we do that? Because to your point, then we can finish talking about the draft and some other things in particular. So if we could just okay. switch to talk about Chris Paul. That was, you know, that probably was the most breaking news around draft time, other than who went where. But you know, Chris Paul. Let's talk about Chris Paul to the Phoenix Suns and his legacy. So, I mean, Chris Paul being traded from the Houston Rockets to the Thunder in the beginning of the season, that whole uh, feud with James Harden or whatever, and we see how that's going for Harden right now. But Chris Paul 
you know, some people think that this is farewell, uh, farewell kind of like season and like easing his way to retirement at the Thunder. The Thunder had a 0.2 percentage uh, to make the playoffs last season. They get a fifth seed in the Western Conference. So Chris Paul's playing, playing well and doing well and leading them to a game seven loss to the Rockets. But he's playing himself up to that caliber to where like teams are starting to say like, hey, is Chris Paul a player that could help us get over the top? And like he's putting himself in the names of these contending teams, GMs. Or like, hey, can Chris Paul be that guy to put us over the top? So he plays himself into a good, uh, in a good company right now. So he's in that good company of where we add him, we'll be good. So he's in the mix of trades, looking to get to a contending team, which ultimately what he wants to do and get his first NBA championship. The Suns are looking; they went eight and zero in the bubble. They're doing really well. Got some key pieces with Kelly Oubre. He didn't play in the bubble, but he was doing well. Ricky Rubio and all, and Javon Carter and uh, DeAndre Ayton. These young players playing well. So Devin Booker, as we know, the last couple of seasons has made it known that he wants to get to the playoffs. Like he wants to contend. He wants to be a playoff caliber team. And it was getting to that point where like a lot of pressure was on the Phoenix organization to get this man some pieces so he can compete at the high level. And so we're seeing Coach Monty Williams get these young players going. And so Chris Paul, having been coached by Monty Williams for the Hornets back in his prime, you know what I mean? So uh, they make that move. They make the move. Bring, I mean, they, they trade Oubre, which Oubre is looking to maybe go to the Warriors. I saw some news like 20 minutes ago, maybe. Uh, 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 Rubio, they traded Rubio to the Thunder, and then which ultimately Rubio goes back to the Timberwolves. It's a lot of moves with that. So Chris Paul, uh, they move a lot of players over because of his salary right now. Uh, he makes quite a bit of money right now. So right. Uh, the Suns had to clear some space. And make some moves. Uh, make some moves for Chris Paul to come. So I mean, Chris Paul's on a team. They're young. They're hungry. They got a nice big man inside with Aiton in there, uh, playing really well as of lately in the bubble. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, Chris Paul can, you know, get those young guys moving with Coach Monty Williams and relieve some of those glory de- glory days. Right. Well, you've done an excellent job, Terry, and kind of laying out the the whole backstory, of what's going on, even when you tied you know, Chris Paul back to this earlier uh, player coach experience with Monty Williams. Shout out to Monty Williams. That's my guy. I've had the pleasure uh, to share with him uh, during times at Michigan State's practice. He's part of the USA family. Uh, You know, I was at practice one day with my USA family, uh, my USA basketball, you know, sweatsuit on, and he was there with his. So we got to take a picture and kick it and talk (laughs) and have great discussion. And he really talked about the perspective of a GM and what they're looking for and how, you know, Michigan State basketball stands out. So fast forward that now to him in this role and what he's done with this young team that really, you know, put people on notice, man, that the Phoenix Suns are nothing to play with. I mean, that came down that one game, that whole game when, you know, you had Devin Booker rocking the Karis LeVert jersey, you know, the Nets version, like, hey, Wins, we can get a chance to make a move, you know, and that's what's right. great about the NBA. I mean, yeah, you don't have everybody making a championship run, but it's those stories that were able to inspire us. It was Devin Booker's play. I think I put a little mixing tape together that, that concluded with him early on when they were leaving the bubble, him hitting mm-hmm. the shot, falling down on his back. And this kid hits what 70 points at the garden. Give me a break, man. So you talk about what's going on with this Phoenix Suns team, but here's what I'm getting into. And you've done a great job, like I said, outlining if this is. Chris Paul's, you know, a uh, 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 farewell song, if it's his swan song, if it's there, is Chris Paul looking at getting involved in uh, the front office, possibly with the Phoenix Suns. If he's going back to a relationship with someone who was his first coach older on, he say, look, let me get back here and I can be a seasoned vet that can help these young guys. Let's, 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 I think it'd be as much as, the, as great as the performance Chris Paul had, I don't think teams would be looking at him to give that all the time, but they're saying he is sure. still good to go. Look what he brings. And not only with him playing, I'll be willing to bet. And I appreciate if I get a text message from you because you watch stuff, you know, frequently. I'll be willing to bet that in the next two to three seasons, more or less, if Chris Paul wraps up and finds himself affiliated with the, you know, Phoenix Suns. That's the home of uh, Jerry Colangelo, uh, uh, you know, the former chairman of USA Basketball. I mean, things move through the Suns, that's 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 a that's a major uh, political piece in the NBA. That's a, that's a respected organization, you know, all the way through basketball. And why wouldn't Chris Paul, NBA Players Association president, why wouldn't he kind of affiliate himself with the Colangelo family or something like that? You know, and getting with Monty Williams. Because I don't think they're looking at saying, "Hey, man, come in and win to get us a championship." Man, come in here and pour into these young men, and you can pour into them 
as a player right beside them, leading them, but potentially as someone who's affiliated with this organization. Because I think every NBA player wants to get down. Now the new the new cool for these guys, man, is like, okay, I want to own the team. And I'll be willing to bet. Somebody like Chris Paul is bright enough and smart enough, even having that Carolina connection when you talk about Jordan, you know, to say, okay, I, what, what, where am I going to land? But when you talk about this could be him wrapping up his playing days and, and, and the fact that he goes to Phoenix – Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, it's deeper than rap, baby. It's something to watch. So I think he did an excellent job of pointing that out. And Chris Paul, man, it's so interesting about him. As popular as he is, and I'm a Chris Paul fan, no doubt, he's had somewhat of a controversial career as far as how he was perceived. It's like he comes across with this uh, very clean you know, image. And I'm not saying anything that he's not. I'm not talking about I know anything negative about him. But then you hear the Rondos of the world make the comment that, oh, he's, he's a difficult guy to deal with. Or you hear these rumblings that, you know, Chris Paul, you know, is no joke. But he's the leader of the Player Association. So I don't care what you say. There's a level yeah, of respect. So I think, you know, using that word respect, I'll quote, you know, the uh, great philosopher Birdman, put some respect on Chris Paul name. You know what I'm saying? Because he's not just an awesome player. He's respected by his peers. I mean, his peers, LeBron, Carmelo, D-Way. I mean, his peers are the higher top echelon of basketball. And Chris Paul, and I got to say it again, on the SPS Ed show, was right there talking to Michael Jordan and talking to all those owners about how we're going to put this bubble yeah. together. Chris Paul was significant in that. So that is telling me that Chris Paul has a future interest and continuing the NBA type experience. And I would not be surprised. And Terry's going to agree with me on the SBA show that if it goes down, he's going to remember and send me a text and say, Lindsay, oh, yeah. you're right when you said that and he gets down. So that was more than a mouthful, but uh, it was great <laughs> to talk about Chris Paul because there's so many layers to him and what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think he's one of the best leaders in basketball I've ever seen. I think you got to think about Magic, Stockton. LeBron, and then, like, Chris Paul. So, I mean, I would say, like, that's, like, the four best leaders we've seen that I can think of right now. And, I mean, the Thunder have been making some moves, too. I mean, before the draft even started, they had a total of 17 first-round picks or, or, or draft picks total mm -hmm. from 2020 to mm -hmm. 2026. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're taking some notes from the Celtics when they made that trade for KG and, and – uh, and Pierce and sent them to the Nets. Right. And they used those picks and got Tatum, uh, Jalen Brown, and, uh, and bringing more of these players that have been helping them get back to where they should be at. So I think they're, they're taking notes there a little bit and getting all these uh, a load of picks and then bringing people. I kind of question their trade with Al Horford. I don't, I don't really think he really fits. It was about the money, though. It was about the money, too. Because got, I, I, Al got a big contract. Right, and I think I think with the contract though, I think it was mostly the Sixers winning that one and and relieving that room for Harden. Money off, yeah, clearing that money, clearing that debt. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, the Suns got a great pickup in in Paul. I hope he stays healthy. That's one of the things that people have been questioning about about if he stays healthy. Because I mean, I think that big month period, people don't talk about how everyone loves to say, "Man, LeBron, this is perfectly set up for Bron. He gonna come in and win. Is a guarantee." I think this, the whole scenario having five months off, I think that couldn't have been better for Chris Paul. Because, yeah. I mean, you got a guy who's resting up and, and uh, has a history of, like, kind of wearing himself down a little bit. And then yeah, he gets, like, a, a, a big break and then comes back and is fresh playing. We, like, we're seeing old glimpses of Chris Paul making these moves through the legs and, you know, fadeaway jump shots. I mean, I think the bubble was a good, uh, it was a good situation for him as well in that trade. Well, we talked about a long time ago that the expectation was that we were going to see a different kind of basketball and different kind of quote unquote stars in the bubble. Now the mainstream act, you know, uh, LeBron himself, you know, remained that King James, but the, the play that we saw from Chris Paul, nobody would have bet on that. And then you, you, you take that play and you equate that, that was equivalent to the play that we saw the Phoenix Suns. So now right. when you think about bringing that together, I think it's something will be watched because there's this, I believe mentality with Monty Williams and the Phoenix Suns and they're out there and um, who knows what kind of impact they're going to have on the West. Cause they're coming out on fire. They are saying they're leaving short of the Miami heat who lost in the NBA championship short of them. I believe it's the Phoenix Suns are saying, Hey, 
We're the ones you got to watch out for. Yeah, we couldn't stay and go through the playoffs, but we were right on the cusp. So they have all that time, just like the Miami Heat, to go off these, you know, five months or so and get ready to come back. And they're going to be saying, hey, man, I'm ready to go, you know, uh, with that. So that has been interesting. You know, I got an idea uh, of what we can do with the remainder of our time because I want to make sure that we're uh, giving our viewers, you know, on the uh, on the streets of talking dot com you know they just do uh we can talk a little bit more about uh the draft particularly uh some other things that happen in draft we'll get into some michigan state people and the last thing i want to do is kind of flip back to uh some topics from somewhat the top of the hour terry and that is uh recruitment being open for michigan state football and i really right. want to talk about how if you really think about everything we've been talking about tonight everything has been about putting yourself in the best position as a player so you can go to the next level whether it's in high school to go play college football or basketball, or if it's in college, to better go to the NBA. And, and it's kind of like a revolving circle because then our conversation evolved to Chris Paul, who's probably at in the twilight of his career playing, but all the other things that can still go on. So uh, we're going to stay on task with that. Uh, we're doing a great job uh, right now. I want to thank again Orlando Watkins for what he's doing. So tell us a little bit more about the drafts and some other things that stood out to you, Terry. You really uh, put some time and effort into that. So talk about this, this 2020 NBA draft. Uh, I mean, just I have two storylines and one kind of like sleeper pick. So I, one, one thing that I took away, you know, you, you see this common theme of like versatility and defense. I mean, like being able to play one through the five, able to switch the pick and roll. Because in the NBA, you see a lot of switching. And yeah, so you see guys practice, like – man. Right. And then you got to play defense. You got to be able to play defense in space. You got to be able to – right. And so I think that's one key point, and this can be looked at among racial lines, but they talk about a lot of white players not being able to make it and stay in the NBA because of their inability to defend based on physicality or whatever it may be. But I just want to highlight that you're absolutely right about the importance of being able to be that and not just be a liability on defense. Right. And I, and I think um, one of the biggest uh, quotes and takeaways that I heard from Jay Billis on there during the coverage, he said the hardest thing of the draft is that they're all rookies. So, I mean, it's like you got teams like the Cavs and the Knicks, you know, and the Warriors kind of right now and the Timberwolves that, like, would love to draft a veteran player, but you never really know what you're going to get. So, I mean, you see teams like a, a very uh, – two. there's two picks that I really loved in this draft. And one was the number eighth pick, the Knicks, which I was hoping the Cavs would get Obi Toppin, but yeah, Obi Toppin. I, I, I wouldn't be mad, but I mean, the, the Knicks got him, New York, born and raised kid, no offers. You know, the first thing you can just see the emotion, the passion from this kid. You know, loving to play the game of basketball, and you know, you hear a lot of rumors like, "Oh, New York, we got to go play with the Knicks." He he reacted it in the most positive way possible, like while he's crying and emotional. They're like, why is that important to you to wear that jersey and be in New York back in your hometown? And he was like, because I'm from New York. This is a dream. This is something that I always wanted to do, rep my home state, wear at my hometown. We weren't playing for that home team. And I and think that's the know, best situation. And that is something for them to get. They, they probably wanted to feel that way about Carmelo, but he had kind of right. came with somewhat of some baggage at the time. And I am a Carmelo fan. But that Obi Toppin, man, I think yeah. he, he's a transcending type player, his size his ability, his passion, his work ethic. And, you know, again, these guys are these underdogs. So I'm glad that you highlighted uh, Obi Toppins being a pick because he was definitely on my radar and has been. And for him to return back home, New York is going to be huge, which is probably why New York say, no, we need this. This is a good story. Yeah. This isn't just a great player. This is somebody who wants to be here. And that'll take that New York uh, 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 critical mm -hmm. fan base a little, you know, it'd be, it'd be a little bit more different with how they respond. So please continue. Right, and so you get somebody who wants to be there, and then now they're looking at maybe trying to get Gordon Hayward. He just opted out of his uh, his contract with the Celtics, the player option. But, you know, you, that's what the Knicks need, uh, a, ch a culture change. Get players that want to be there and want to be around for that change. And can put up with, with, with what the New Yorkers give you. They say there's no media markets, no yeah. – Fans like New Yorkers, man. I mean, you know, whether you call it rude by nature, but you would have to be from there, you know, right. to be able to understand that. Really. Mm -hmm. but I'm happy to hear that about Obi Top. And then the second uh, storyline that I really loved was the 15th pick, Orlando Magic draft, Cole Anthony, son of uh, Greg Anthony, former running Rebels, you know, back in the yeah. day with uh, UNLV with the Shark, Coach Shark. But, um, yeah. I mean, just seeing him, 
you know, this this story, I think, really caught me, you know, really touched me a little bit because we got a guy who's projected to go, uh, you know, top five coming in uh, with North Carolina, and he's he's having a great start to his season and gets hurt, you know, and, and, having, and having to go through that surgery, you know, and it, this is a guy who didn't choose to sit out and get ready for the draft. He said, no, I'm going to finish what I started no matter the record, because North Carolina, this is probably one of the worst seasons that we've yeah. seen out of North Carolina the past season. Yeah. Him not even worrying about the record, this guy comes back and is like, no, I'm finishing what I started and comes back and plays pretty well. It wasn't many victories because the, the program kind of, I feel like, gave up. But, like, him, you didn't see one bit of quit out of that kid. I mean, he's gritty. He wants to win. And I think he may be a little undersized, but – I mean, that's a lot of toughness out of that kid to want to come back and play still. And you, you can just see the emotion. Like, I wasn't really uh, – I didn't know how much I'd be here. This is the toughest moment for me going through that surgery and going through that time. You know, just to see that the magic – I think that might be kind of a steal because I think he's a great player. I think he's a, a elite scorer. He plays tough on defense. He's a great leader. I mean, you, you could just see the whole demeanor change when he left. And as soon as he came back, they're getting competitive with Duke. That that Duke game that went into OT yep. and that had like that hard finish for him. You can just see the fight and the grip in him. And it was just good to see that, you know, that he was like, you know, how, you know, a little personal side of him, you know, what I'm saying that like, it's my first surgery. I could I want to thank my parents for being here with me. You mm -hmm. know, you can just see, you know, he felt he was a little underlooked a little bit, you know, going from top five and falling down to the end of the lottery status pick. And so I mean, I thought that was a great pick by that's, the Magic. That's still, that guarantee though that that, that, that lottery pick. Though, you know? <laughs> but then also, right. I would think he's also playing with a chip on his shoulder for a number of reasons. His physical stature is a little undersized, and then he's a, he's the son of of an NBA, you know, and, and a basketball legend, if you will. Greg Anthony, come on, give me a break. I don't care how you felt about the running mm -hmm. rebels or whatnot. He's a, next to the five five, the running rebels. You know, what I'm saying that's like whoa, put some respect on my name for real. So you know, having uh, that kind of scrutiny, I would imagine, you know, or whatnot. But I do think it says a lot, and I and I guess where you really see the payoff is when he got to sit down with those GMs, you know, and, and talk to these guys and, and to say, well, this is my body of work. Yeah, I know I'm Greg Anthony's son. Yeah, I might be a little undersized, but it's like, look, this is what I've done. I came back and I fought even when my mm -hmm. team wasn't winning. I still right. can't show it up. And I think, I think what happens is when you look at a draft night, you hear some of these players, you know, Terry talking about, you know, you know, I never forget this night and the moment it's like, this is what all the work is for. So when you get there, you can say, this is why I'm here, you know? And then also when you're interviewing, you know, these general managers and these other, you know, team influencers, and, and you want to better tell a great story. Look, man, this is how I work. This is what I did. You don't want to go into that sit down, worried about what people are going to better say about, you know, but we saw that. So you talked about those being the two storylines. You know, we had the continued storyline with Michigan State. Everyone was checking for Xavier Tillman and Cassius Winston. Uh, I was able to snag, uh, uh, the post-game interview with both uh, X and uh, Cassis. And I think there was an interesting theme with that because both of them, Terry, were very uh, specific about uh, the underdog status, falling to the round on which they failed, just like you referenced with Cole Anthony and whatnot. Uh, and they talked about Coach Izzo and the influence he had. So let me play a little bit from Xavier. We'll, we'll check him out. And then uh, we'll just check back in. So give me a second. I'll get that going for you. Okay. I mean, no, I haven't talked to Coach since. He texted me, I think, literally like five minutes before I got picked. Like, you hang in there. I promise you everything's going to work out. But now let this, you know, he said, let you getting passed up on in the first round be a fire so you're always motivated to get go out and get better. You know, he said it's in DNA like us. or It's in, it's in our DNA talking about me and him, you know, to, to get passed up on, but to show people and put in the work. Yeah, he, said, he texted me like five minutes before I got picked, and then I'm um, it kind of like kept my head up, and I was like, okay, okay, I'm hanging there. Coach believes me, I got it, I'm hanging there. And um, yeah, the app, right, it's like literally like five picks later, I got picked, and I'm like, oh, all right, it wasn't that long. So definitely, um, yeah. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go and go to uh, Cassis too, because their their comments are so similar. So I'll go Cassis, and we'll talk about them both. Yeah, I heard from Izzo. Uh, he was one of the first to, you know, I think he was probably one of the first to talk to the uh, Wizards coaches. He told me how, Exciting they sound, uh, how exciting they 
sounded that they could get me, uh, that, I, that I was coming to their organization, uh, how proud he was of me. Uh, and how I've been in this situation before, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've been doubted before. Uh, I've been told things that I can't do and what things will hold me back. And I know what that situation feels like. And look what I made of it before. So he said, yeah, I full faith that I can go out there and do it again. Keep uh, having faith in my work, trust in myself, and go out there and make it happen. Wow, Terry. Now look at that. You know, on the biggest night of these guys' lives, they still have to, you know, talk, you know, live the underdog story. You know, isn't that a crazy, you know, juxtaposition yeah. of just ex life experiences? Like they talk about, you know, feeling nervous until their name was called. And then when their name was called, it all went away and it didn't mean anything. But then even still, the storyline is, you know, what I have to prove. Xavier went on and said that, you know, he's going to keep that chip on his shoulder for every team that passed him up until the end of his career. So so I guess what I'm getting at is, and this is kind of keeping in, you know, stride with the SPS Ed show and, and what we want to focus on with mental toughness. You know, how important is it to be slighted in order to be motivated to be up for a huge task? I mean, these guys are going to be getting up every day saying, look, man, you didn't, you, you didn't believe in me. So there's like, I still got to prove to you. And I'm amongst the best of the best in the world, getting paid a handsome dollar to do what I love and what I would probably do for free, absolutely. But you still get in doubt it, you know, even when your name gets called. You know, what do you think that's like, Terry? I think, you know, we always think of first of motiv what motivation and like finding your why as like the go-to number one thing that you should figure out before you even have uh, any kind of, um, way of doing something you should always find your why first but then again the first example I comes to that that comes to my mind is you know MSU being that blue collar work hard gritty school the first example that I think of is Draymond Green I remember he remembers the list of everybody that got drafted before him and like he remembers that to this day like he can go off the top of his head right now and be like boom 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 and list everybody that got drafted and I think Cassius I mean it, it, it broke my heart a little bit because it's like, this is somebody who is arguably one of the most valuable players in college basketball. Like, you know what you're going to get out of Cassius Winston every night. Like, you might you might get maybe a, a 40 ball on a good, like, 30. Yep. He's going to give you like maybe like 28 and 10 on a, on, a, on a very good, on the highest level. I mean, we saw him against Duke uh, in that Elite Eight, and mm -hmm. we saw him uh, play his heart out through uh, – terrible traumatic experience with losing the, and, and uh, losing his brother. I mean, we see him proven to be that guy. I mean, a lot of times people have been questioning his athleticism and, and uh, his style of play. And is he quick enough to compete with those guards? I mean, I see a, a, a Chris Paul in him a little bit. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think, and I think his, his, his play style is like very much like the NBA. I mean, Cassius may not be the fastest guy in the world, but he knows how to get to his spots. He's, he's an excellent passer. Defense probably is something that he needs to probably work on. And now he probably say it himself. You know, Izzo used to get on him all the time about defense. Right. But, I mean, NBA, they don't play defense. So, I mean, my thing is, is that if if he improves a little bit defensively and, uh, and, and playing and uh, getting better and, and continuing to get uh, more athletic and continue to pass well and having a great IQ, like that was one of the things that Izzo would always say about Cassius, is IQ. You know, and I heard a story about whenever he went to go see uh, Cassius play and he told his mom, he was like, your son has a chance to be one of the best MSU point guards that uh, one of the best point guards MSU has ever seen. And like and I think, you know, just seeing that and having him struggle his freshman year and be doubted. like We didn't know too much about Cassius. We were really uh, cautious about saying he's going to be good and this and that. Coming off the hype of the state championship at University. Right. We thought it was just a hype. Right. Right, and then moving on to being uh, arguably one of the best MSU basketball players that, that, that they've ever seen. I mean, it's, you can just see the growth. And I think uh, he has a chance, once again, to kind of have that growth going through COVID and Washington loving his game and him having that chance. I mean, we see the guard play with – we don't know if John Wall is going to be uh, okay. Probably not going to be there, but you're right. So, I mean, hey, I mean, it's a great oh, opportunity. We're saying we need some support in the guard position, you know, because they right. try to get a vet guard that can come in and got him to be groomed after. And I think guys also like to take, guys being these uh, NBA teams, like to take advantage of not just the player, but the colleges in which they come from. 
You know, Coach yeah. Ellis has an excellent reputation in the NBA for being, you know, gritty. You know, you talk about that with Xavier Tillman going to the uh, mm -hmm. Memphis Grizzlies where they already had Jaron Jackson there. And he he showed what that work ethic was like by just being there one year. Right. So imagine what Xavier Tillman's going to bring after being there three what, years, you know? That's what they do. That's what they yeah. do out there in, uh, in Memphis. That's one of the biggest uh, emphasis about playing, being gritty. You see John Morant, you know, they got some rookies on that team that had that dog and that underdog, uh, had that dog mentality coming in. And I think X is going gonna, is gonna to do great with that. I think having Jaron, you know, be that big brother to him a little mm -hmm. bit. And I think I think X is going to come off the bench, give him all the energy he can, like he did start that here at MSU. And I think he's going to be a huge plus. I think that's a great steal. And uh, X can guard. He can he can uh, go on the perimeter and play defense on some guards for a little bit. So mm -hmm. I think that was a great pick. Yeah, no, excellent. And you talk about work ethic, man. That kid is going to show up every day. I mean, people will mm -hmm. refer to him as being older beyond his years, but that man has literally grown. He's a grown man with a family. You know what I'm saying? And he's right. He worked with mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and, and if anybody's more deserving, you know, both these guys are. So, was so I was so happy to be able to see them and having seen these guys on their journey, man, and be able to have, you know, a quiet conversation with these guys, be able to talk about things that were positive and inspirational. I, I like to think that I've always able to be a positive person around them. So I, I'm wishing nothing the best, but the best for Xavier Tillman and Cassius Winston. Cassius, familiar with his family, you know his dad as well, mm -hmm. uh, knew his brother, you know, but, um, to see these young men transition is inspiring. I posted something on social media, man, and you can see the outpouring of love of people being happy for these guys to go on and do that, man. I think that's really, really important with what's going on. So uh, we've been doing some good stuff, man. Uh, I want to uh, keep with the theme of what's going on, man, talking about this draft and moving forward. But even with the same, I kind of want to go back to what we were talking about with Coach Mel Tucker earlier, that he kind of put out this all call throughout the state of Michigan and beyond that, hey, MSU was going to be recruiting a little differently. Hey. You know? Michigan State University has had a reputation for only, you know, recruiting in certain areas and things like that and, you know, kind of looking past so many people. So Mel Tucker, uh, he's hitting the ground running, trying to stay connected. And I'm very fortunate to have been close to that, to witness that. So well, let me share his comments, uh, you know, follow up to his comments from our last, uh, you know, time that we talked with him. And uh, matter of fact, I'll go back a little bit and give a fuller version. So this will be a little lengthy, but we got some time, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. Knows how, how good he can be. Thanks, Mel. Next question goes to Lindsey Huddleston. Hello, Mel. Um, I know you are laser focused on Maryland right now, but considering we're halfway through uh, your first year uh, this season and there's talk of uh, transfer portal and things like that, and you use terms like dealing in truth, what message can you give uh, to the fans about uh, the future talent transition that the Mel Tucker era is going to start to experience? Yeah, we're uh, that's a great question um, because we're, we're battling and building at the same time. It's battle and build, battle and build. You know, so um, as we're developing the team that we have, we're also recruiting, you know, every single day um, to bring in players that we feel like can can help us be successful, you know, on and off the field. So, you know, we're doing that. And then obviously the portal is, is, uh, is part of college football. You know, you got the, you got the high school kids, and then you got the, the undergrad portal guys, you got the grad transfers, you have junior college guys. And so, you know, we're, we're, you know, we look everywhere for, for players that we believe are a good fit for us. Um, and we look to acquire those players. And at the same time, when you evaluate your current team, um, you know, ultimately you're deciding who's a good fit on this team. You know, who, who, who has the, the traits and the characteristics, um, you know, talent, you know, the toughness, mental and physical toughness, you know, the intention to detail, sense of urgency, love of the game, you know, um, you know, who, who has those, those, uh, those traits that, those characteristics that you need to, to have on your team to be successful. And so, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, there's, there's transition, not only acquiring guys to the team, but there's also guys that, you know, ultimately, you know, make, may transition out um, just because of, uh, you know, there's a certain type of culture and, and, um, and certain type of 
of uh, player that, that we need to have here. And, you know, that's, that's really non-negotiable. So, you know, everything's an evaluation and halfway through the season, um, you, know, I, you know, right at this point, we have a pretty good idea of, of you know, who can do what. And so, um, yeah, obviously, you know, you can anticipate seeing some, some movement on our roster whether it's, uh, you know, portal related or, or otherwise. Okay. And as a very quick follow-up, does that mean uh, non-traditional Michigan state type players may have an opportunity to play here or it would just be something uh, that we've seen before? Um, if you could just give me a little more clarification on well, that. Yes. In, in my role, I'm in touch with a lot of young people and people either say we've heard from a school like a Michigan state or Michigan or we haven't even heard from them, but they may be very talented. So, I mean, are you turning over, over every stone or is it going to be pretty much same places and regions as before? No, 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 no. We, we, we turn over, we turn over every, every stone. Um, we, we, we cast a broader net. It's, it's a lot more work to do it that way, but we cast a broader net. Um, like if you want to sign 25 guys, it's typically an eight to one ratio on offers. Like you got to offer 200 guys, you know, we're, you know, we, we're, we're always well over 300 offers per per class, um, and so um, you know they could it could be west west coast, east coast. We go down to the south. Um, obviously, we want to start here in our state. We're fighting. We're fighting for the hearts and the minds of our high school coaches and our in-state prospects as well, um, just to to show them that you know what. What the different, you know, what the difference is now, what you know, how we do things, and compared to the past, and so, um, and anyone that has a player, um, you know, that we we evaluate those, we evaluate those players, and try to get back to those those high school coaches or anyone as fast as we can, and uh, and we're always on the phone, um, you know, just looking for you know looking for any any anyone that we think might have a chance and we get the film evaluated and uh and and so we're we're you know we're looking everywhere for for guys every day actually every day all right thank you for that coach have a good day yep you too thanks so next question um, goes to rico beard with 97 uh, won the ticket in detroit excuse me hey coach uh you spoke about the so um that was huge, man. Um, that got a lot of traction on social media. Uh, I shared that. You probably saw, saw me sharing that. And just telling, you know, I was pretty much telling coaches and players in the state of Michigan, hey, man, hey, pick your head up because it's a new sheriff in town. And Michigan State is really about that life. They're going to be out here. He even gave you the number, numerical breakdown. You know, some are offering 200. We're offering 300. You know, and I think what people get confused about is that the offer process is much different in college football than it is in basketball. Right. But the fact remains that he's talking about we're evaluating players. So if you got a player, share us the information and we're going to get back to you. You know, so I think that was really good. But I think it's also important, man, because that's the type of message that should inspire people. That's the type of message to say, you know what, I may not be a big name right now, uh, i.e. Cassius Winston or Xavier Tillman. I may not be the guy everybody wants to get right now, but if I come and show and prove and work hard and put myself out there, I mean, this is really at the core, Terry, of what, you know, this whole movement that we have with SPS is about. If I really just, you know, put in the work, man, if I show up for work, there's a chance a school like Michigan State will look at me and say, you know, we like what we say, we want to give you a shout. So that's why my question to Coach Tucker, I said, is it going to be the non-traditional Michigan State student? It's going to be the student you wouldn't expect. Are you going to be in out? Are you going to not just be in certain regions? Are you going to just be all over and where you have to go? And uh, he's committed to that, man. And I've seen evidence of that by his ability to reach out to these coaches and, and connect with people. And I just think it's really inspiring to see that, you know, uh, uh, it's heartwarming to say, look, Man, if you work hard, you go get a chance, you know, and that's mm -hmm. important. So, what do you think? I think that's. I think you hit it right there. Uh, you know, in the question, uh, turning more stones over. You know, I think that's the key. I mean, you see over the years um, these big name players and that have great impacts on their teams in that transfer porter. I think uh, a lot of teams don't usually think they can find much talent in there. But, I mean, we've seen it down there with Oklahoma and Lincoln Riley. I mean, over the years, we've seen uh, transfer quarterbacks. So it all I think uh, what I'm going to reference to, it all started with uh, Baker Mayfield. He was a transfer from Texas Tech. 
Then coming in, Kyler Murray. Then Jalen Hurts. I mean, those guys weren't recruited there. So I think it's, it's good to see uh, that he's not really limited to himself to uh, just the offers people. Like, we're just going to go out and offer one. We're just going to try and find one. And it's good to show because, I mean, I took a reference last week during that uh, Indiana-Michigan State game. Uh, Coach Allen is also having, having a ton of recruits come out of uh, states that have SEC schools. So they're not limiting themselves as well. And I think I think that's very key when you're trying to rebuild something. You're not just like limiting yourself to uh, recruits and, and uh, trying to get more freshmen to come in. If there's someone that is, you know, well, uh, well tuned in, uh, in a fundamentals and what they want there at MSU and he's in that transfer portal, we're going to go out and reach out to him. If that's something that we think is a need and something that could give us a positive which I think they they might do for the quarterback position next year. I think that would be key for them. I think that I'm glad he said that because he, he's making it known that like we're not going to settle here. We're going to keep evaluating every week, and I think that's very key for a a, a guy a, you know a coach that's talking about building and battling, building and battling. Like in the in the behind the scenes, we're gonna keep building, but right now we're focusing on battling. I think we're gonna see a ton of uh, hard work being paid off as we start seeing these top guys start coming in. I mean, some four or five star guys and maybe even some top caliber um, transfer guys coming into East Lansing. Yeah, no, nah, man, you, you, you were really uh, getting to it, man. You're right. Um, battling for the hearts and minds of the coaches and players in our state. I mean, that line right there was in the Detroit free press. You know, it was like, yeah. after I posed that question, the other reporters were like, man, he, he's, he's really spitting, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that put that out there, but I like how it put that, fire up under people like man let's get to it you know and uh that's what he has to do i think that's really his nice way of saying these are my players this is the team i yeah. inherit and and, and yeah. i have a standard <laughs> and a lot of these guys wouldn't be playing for me let's be f fair and i like the fact that True. he's very frank when he says that and it's evident he's like look we're constantly being evaluated and you notice that discussion start happening more going into week three because right. i'm thinking that he was like man look you know, yeah, we, we lost to Rutgers. Okay, first game. We beat Michigan. We turn around and this Indiana and this Iowa thing happened. That Iowa train, train wreck. <laughs> Woo, beating them down in Indiana. And then he's also probably seeing how his players are reacting. You know, it's not so much, you know, mm -hmm. are you in a tough time? What are you doing at halftime? How are you responding? Is that fight in you? You know, are these guys ready to step up? Because again, one of the very easy ways to tell the difference between the Mel Tucker era that's going to be and what Coach D'Antonio had going on, these guys didn't run every position when they were on the practice field. They said, oh, yeah. we run everywhere now. And it was just like that subtle change probably is enough to tell a guy, man, I don't know if I want to be in this program. I don't and know I if think, I want to that. You know how that goes, yeah. Jerry. You, out there, you had teammates, you know, <laughs> that you having to be a leader, had to get yourself out there, and other guys don't, go, don't want to push. Last one coming in, you know, and like, how can you be a great team if you have people like that? How can you be yeah. like that? There's no way. So I think uh, Mel Tucker is excellent in communicating this point. But I, again, and I'll say another thing, better watch out for it too. This might be another one. You have to text message me on too. You might have to text message me sooner than <laughs> anything else. It might be Michigan uh, commit, Andrew Anthony out of East Lansing High School. Uh, maybe he might get flipped. Might get flipped by good old Coach Mel Tucker and be at Michigan State. I mean, it's right in his backyard. People don't know uh, what the future of Coach Jim Harbaugh may be at Michigan. I do know some other Michigan recruits, and they tell me, look, we was going to Michigan no matter who the coach was. And these are huge mm -hmm. linemen and whatnot, and I can understand that. They're like, look, I'm going to go play at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to make my move. But someone like Andrew <laughs> Anthony it could be the same thing, but there's a different kind of personal connection because Michigan State is right here. Your teammate, Ethan Boyd, is going there. Y'all got this momentum going through the playoffs right now. Who knows? Y'all could potentially win the state championship. I mean, there's so many things at play. So I'll be very interested to see if the diligence of Coach Mel Tucker is going to start paying off sooner than we think. And I think I, I'm pretty sure I know, knowing Ethan and Drew, I know Ethan's probably in his ear talking about, hey, man, you sure? You sure? You know, I mean, it's, it's teammates. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, think about what happened. That. Michigan State, Ethan wasn't even on Michigan State's uh, radar uh, prior yeah. to Coach Tucker getting there. You know what I'm saying? He was going mm -hmm. to Cincinnati. He was about yeah. to go to the University of Cincinnati, play for Coach mm -hmm. Fickle, and it's ironic because that was the person they were considering for the Michigan mm -hmm. State job. He had to call Coach Fickle, say, no bet. 
I'm going to stay here with Coach Mel Tucker. I'm going to be right here at Michigan State in my own backyard. I mean, that's like Obi Toppin playing for the Knicks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, hey, right. we'll see. And like I said, with the uncertainty of Jim Harbaugh, man, you know, and, and I'm like I say, uh, somebody like Coach Tucker is being very diligent. They're going at it. You know what I'm saying? He's still at it. You know, he, he said, I got until you sign. I got up until you sign. So yeah, that's how you see what we'll come for that. But it's exciting, man. It's exciting that amongst COVID, we're still able to see the competitive nature of things. You're able to see the guy who works hard get his just due. You're able to see kids live out their dreams. And I'm really so proud of these athletes uh, throughout the state of Michigan right now with this play pause play pause and the one of the posts I put up after they pause for these three weeks until December 9th I'm like look man uh, keep your head up stay focused and be ready I mean yeah, I what other way to display mental toughness is to have to pause from your play and stay in the mindset no a is coming back and then you know and, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that many of them are very motivated because there was a time when we say hey we're not playing at all we didn't even know what was going to happen. So with that being said, man, uh, I really want to wish our young people in the state of Michigan, all throughout the country and the world, but particularly here at home in Michigan, you know, uh, you know, kudos to you guys for keeping your heads up, staying locked in. I hear that the restart may lead to all playoff games. That's all playoff games, Terry, being played at Ford Field. Nice. I hear that. And that's what I'm saying. Look, it's going to be too cold to be playing outside. If we pushing it back, hey, we bring everybody down here. And I like the idea because for me, that is more of a logistic. That's that's literally somewhat of a bubble. Somewhat, yeah. you know, because they can manage it. It's not about each site, each school. It's like the logistics of the NFL can be put into place. And I think that's a great thing. And you know, yours truly with SPS will be there covering those games and bring you some of that. So Terry, we've done it, man. We've kind of come you know, to the top of the hour. We've been rocking for a good hour, man. I, I was excited about the things that we were talking about and the topics, man, because it's like when you talk about following sports, you follow, you know, the pulse of the world. I mean, there was a time a few weeks ago we were talking about social justice, and I'm glad that we had a platform. You did an excellent job in expressing the views of many young people like yourself and what they were thinking on both sides you know, of the political aisle because of your diverse group of people that you're involved with, and that's a great thing. Uh, Coach, uh, Orlando Watkins, I want to thank you, man, for keeping us locked in, you know, keeping us uh, out here on Facebook Live. Shout out to everybody on Facebook Live. I want to shout out to Easy Work, my guy over there, uh, Bruce Tony, holding it down with Easy Work. We're going to keep some things going with Easy Work out here. And also to the Streets is Watching podcast. You can find us on www.thestreetsofthetalking.com uh, every Saturday and Sunday. 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. You turn on, you hear my voice. Hear this young man, Terry McCord Jr. spitting the facts. And we're just happy to hopefully be able to inspire people. So with that, Terry, you got anything else you want to share before we get out of here? No, just uh, prayers for Clay Thompson. Again, I uh, suffered a torn Achilles, you know, in a workout. Him trying to get back to where he was. And he gets injured again another year-long season-ending uh, season ending, uh, injury. So, Hopefully, speedy recovery, a great player, great attitude, like another guy, underlooked, uh, dog mentality, pushing through, fighting all odds. So prayers to him, have a speedy recovery, and hopefully he can get back to that clay that we know he is. No, man, that's really, you know, really great of you to say that. You know, prayers out to him, and that's part of the sports. We celebrate guys getting drafted last night, but all in the same, you can have a season injury, and let's hope not career-ending injury, but that's how this goes. So we're very fortunate, Terry, that we're still able to stay connected to sports. We're very fortunate, Terry, that we're able to build a level of uh, credibility amongst those in this community that we can bring a message that can help people and stay inspired. So with that... This is Lindsey Huddleston and Terry McCord Jr. with the SPS Edge Show. I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank Coach Orlando Watkins for keeping us together. We call him Houston because uh, he holds us down while we're out here in the world. So with that, we'll see you guys next week. And uh, thank you for supporting the SPS Edge.